Good evening. In accordance with Board of Education policy, as senior member of this board, I would like to call this organizational meeting of the Board of Education to order for the purpose of electing officers. Before I begin, I'd like to extend a warm welcome back to Mr. Maroney and Mr. Deneen and welcome new member, Sarah Parent. I'd also like to say a quick thank you to Mike Burke for his amazing service. He will be missed and I hope he's watching us tonight. Moving on, okay. Pursuant to our policy, I will ask for nominations for each of the positions, chairperson, vice chairperson, and secretary. Once all the nominations have been made and seconded, we will then vote position by position. I'll begin. May I have nominations for chairperson? And this is Richie. I nominate Duke Deneen. Is there a second? I second. Mrs. Ackman seconds. Okay. Are there any other nominations for chair? Seeing none, we'll move on. May I have nominations for vice chairperson? Mr. Deneen. Great. Are there any seconds? Mrs. Parent seconds. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Seeing as none, I will move on. May I have a nomination for secretary? Mrs. Ackman. I nominate Sarah Parent. Is there a second? I will second. Uh, are there any other nominations for secretary? Mr. Maroney. I nominate Jill McCammon. Is there a second? Mr. Sini seconds. Thank you. Now that all the nominations and seconds are in order, we will vote on each position. All those in favor of electing Duke Deneen for the position of chair, please indicate by raising your hand. That is unanimous. Congratulations, Mr. Deneen. You are the new chair of the Board of Education. All those in favor of, uh, in, in favor of electing Deborah Ritchie as vice chair of the Board of Education, please raise their hand. That is unanimous. Congratulations, Mrs. Ritchie. You are now the new vice chairwoman of the Board of Education. All those in favor of electing Sarah Parent for the position of secretary, please indicate by raising your hand. All those opposed? Oh, sorry. Sorry, Parent Ackman Stein. All those opposed? McCammon? All those at uh, McCammon, Sini, and Maroney. Abstentions? Richie Brown, were you a? No, sorry, <coughs> Mr. Deneen, sorry. Can you just read the vote again? Yeah, so four, Ackman, Parent, Stein, opposed, McCammon, Sini, Maroney, Deneen, abstention, Brown, and you. you know, so two vote. abstentions. Four no's and yes. three. Okay. Great. Okay. Seeing as that vote didn't carry, may I please have a motion to, uh, uh, sorry, all those in favor of electing Mrs. McCammon for the position of secretary, please indicate by raising your hand. That is Sini, McCammon, Brown, Ritchie, Maroney, Deneen. All those opposed? Ackman, Parent, Stein, no abstentions. The motion carries. Congratulations, Mrs. McCammon. You are secretary of the board. Um, may I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? Mr. Sini moves and Mrs. Ackman seconds. Thank you. I will now. Okay, all in favor? Oh, all in favor. <laughs> Sorry, that's not on my script. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will now turn over the running of the meeting to Mr. Denis. And now we have to switch seats.
you may need some guidance, but thank you. So um, welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Education, Tuesday, November 10th, 2020, Darien Public School Administrative Offices. Um, call to order, uh, Board Chairperson's Report. Keep me on track here, all those folks that have done this previously <laughs> while sitting here and listening, it, you don't always uh, grasp it all. So uh, just uh, as quick as I can, I know we have a lot of good work to go. Uh, good evening and thank you. I look forward to continuing to serve on the Darien Board of Education and thank you to my board colleagues for the opportunity and honor to be chairperson. It is not about me or this board, it's about the students, teachers, administrators, parents, and the whole Darien community. We are a group of volunteers working and collaborating with a great superintendent and professional staff, all in the support of a great student learning experience. Our Board of Education philosophy is schools exist for children. I believe if we look at any opportunity or challenge with that guiding point, we will continue to be a highly performing district and prepare all students for the future. Our goal of the district does not change this pandemic in delivering our education goals and creating equity for students. Um, we as a board have a deep appreciation for the dedication and hard work required to be a teacher, school administration, and part of the district leadership. We applaud your efforts every day, even more important in this pandemic environment. Keeping our students safe and our staff safe in this environment is our priority. We have the best group of professionals on the education side working 24 by 7 with the best group of healthcare professionals supporting the district and the town. We need continued patience, understanding, and good communication from all sides. We are learning and adapting each day. It's a fluid process and will continue to change. We're a fortunate town um, and we need to keep that perspective. Our schools are opening and while there are challenges each day, we are working hard to keep our students safe and to keep school open. I believe a thank you is in order for our former board colleague, Mike Burke. A uh, quick thank you for Katie for helping me organize some great thoughts around a truly talented volunteer over his last terms. To quote the great Joe DiMaggio, a person always doing his or her best becomes a natural leader just by example. Yes, Mike thinks he could have been a Yankee in his day. <laughs> Mike Burke always came to the board table having done his homework, prepared to do what was best for the children of Darianne. He was never the most vocal board member in the room, but when he spoke, you knew it was going to be relevant and insightful. His legal acumen helped frame many a difficult discussion and provided a lens that no other board member could provide. Mike was always the first one to raise his hand and volunteer for not so glamorous jobs and took any assignment with pride and a smile on his face. He was an instrumental member of the negotiation team and helped guide the district with his deep knowledge of litigation. He served on the finance committee, facilities committee and recently chair of policy committee and did a tremendous job of helping Marge update our policies and make sure we're current with COVID guidelines. What we all will miss most about Mike is his warm disposition and collegiality. He always arrived early to meetings and engaged even a member of the board and staff in personal conversations. I do not think we ever saw Mike in a bad mood. Being a member of the Darien Board of Ed gave Mike tremendous joy and was evident at every meeting. <clears throat> we will miss you, Mike. Wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Please, not do be, please do not be a stranger to our board. The one thing I said to Mike when I saw him the other day was, um, while it's upsetting that he's not here in terms of the relationship we developed, but out of his uh, participation on the board, I, I gained a lifelong friend. So I thank you for that, Mike. I would also like to formally welcome Sarah Parent to the board. She is well known for her advocacy for Darian's children and families. She's held many leadership roles in Darian. Uh, until June, she was the co-chair of the CD SP, and she currently sits on the district's district planning committee. She's been a member of the RTM and is a current clerk of the Public Health and Safety Committee. Uh, we welcome Sarah and look forward to working with her. I wanna also welcome back Dennis. Thank you for all your service and commitment and your ongoing service to our students. I wanna end by thanking Tara Ackman, our chairperson over the last three years and tireless advocate for the students of Darianne. Thank you for your leadership and focus on the students and guiding us to stay focused on our philosophy of schools exist for children. Her focus through the pandemic has been 24 seven on how we open schools, keep them open and keep everyone safe. As chair, she successfully guided the board through a superintendent search. I believe that to be you, Dr. Adley. 
and was the voice in Hartford when needed to make our voice heard about maintaining our control over a high performing district supported by our parents. Thank you, Tara. I look forward to continuing to work with you on the important work of the Board of Education and on behalf of our students and community. Thank you very much. We'll move on now to public comment. Good evening. If you would like to speak during public comment, click the participants icon on the button of your Zoom screen. Next, click the raised hand option. You will notice a blue hand icon appear in the upper corner of your screen where your face, name, and or number appears. When it is your turn to speak, the facilitator will identify you and announce that you are unmuted for public comment. Once recognized and unmuted, please state your name and address. You will have up to three minutes to comment. Username Lori Olson's iPhone. You are unmuted and recognized. Hi, my name is Lori Olson. I live at 16 Little Brook Road North. In full transparency, I am co-chair of the Council of Darien School Parents. But tonight I speak as a Darien Public Schools parent. Public trust is a fragile thing. The community is likely to be suspicious of a public organization that meets to conduct business behind closed doors, especially if only some of the members are invited to attend. Today I learned that our elected Republican members of the Board of Education held a private closed door caucus last night to discuss Board of Education decisions. They will tell you this meeting was legal. It was, but it was, but was it transparent, collaborative and nonpartisan? Constituents, <clears throat> keep asking for transparency, open communication and nonpartisan cooperation because it is in the best interest of our school children. When we hear only what we wanna hear and mute views that don't align with ours, we lose the ability to make the most meaningful and impactful decisions. When only one side gathers along party lines, our community loses. Even more importantly, our children lose. We didn't elect six members to the Board of Education, we elected nine. From this point going forward, I hope and expect to see more collaborative Board of Education meetings with all members participating. You are one board, we are one school district, we are one community, and we are better than this. Thank you, Mrs. Olson. You, username Stacy TA, you are unmuted. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, my name is Stacy TA. I live at 10 Clocks Lane. Um, as a member of the RTM's Finance and Budget Committee, I do not speak for the committee, but I did talk to Jack today and he gave me permission to request that we push the RTM Finance and Budget presentation to the board um, on the budget to January 19th meeting. With the budget meeting being on January 9th, presenting on the 12th doesn't give us enough time to prepare. As an individual, I would like to say the following. It has come to my attention that once again, the Republican members of the Board of Education have held a caucus without warning. While holding a caucus of your party is legal, it does not send a signal of transparency, collaboration, and unity to our community. Additionally, I am disappointed that the Republicans of the Board of Education chose not to follow long-standing precedent of including a member of the minority party in its leadership. Once again, this shows a lack of willingness to collaborate and bring our community get together at a time when we have so much at stake and we should be uniting. Finally, I would like to thank Mrs. Ackman for serving as chair of the Board of Education these last few years, especially through this pandemic. Thank you, Mrs. Tiang. User Elizabeth Drew, you are unmuted and recognized. Mrs. Ms. Drew. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Drew. I live at 14 Du Bois Street. I have a second grader and kindergartner at Hinley. The in-person learning has been going beautifully. The children are safe, happy, and healthy. We have only had one case at Hinley. The teachers, administration, our principal, Mrs. Droller, our nurse, Lisa Grant, Everyone deserves all the accolades for keeping our children engaged and learning while also safe. 
I was initially hesitant to speak tonight because I have spoken a fair amount already in these public meetings and I do not wish to beat a dead horse. But I have concerns and after conversations with many parents all over Darien, they do too. As COVID cases rise again across the country and here in Connecticut, many parents are very worried about the elementary schools going remote again. While I cannot speak for older learners and families with older children, tonight I can speak for our children and for our concern regarding the remote experience for young learners. Tonight, I would ask that Dr. Adley and the Board of Education recognize that younger children and the families of, of younger children are in a unique situation and then that, in that they cannot learn remotely the same way that older children can. From a logistics perspective, it is not possible for parents with multiple young learners, some who cannot yet read, to make sure the remote learning gets properly done. The distractions on computers for children are many. The level of engagement for young learners on a computer is low. Live, in-person learning and engagement with peers is crucial for social, emotional, and academic well-being of these young children. As the holidays near and fear of spread in the high school and fear of and fear of spread of COVID in the high school and beyond town rise, I would ask the Board of Ed and Dr. Adley to think creatively about ways to prioritize in-person learning for the younger demographic. I understand that our town is putting mandates in place, limiting restaurants and non-essential businesses capacity, but schools are not non-essential. Our town should be prioritizing school first. Thank you everyone for your time and dedication to keeping Darien schools thriving. Thank you, Mrs. Drew. Carolina Magui, you are unmuted and recognized. Good evening, uh, my name is Carolina Magoi and I'm at 28 Kensett Lane. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Burke for his service to our town and specifically, specifically for his volunteering these last six years with the Board of Education. You have been an incredible advocate for our children, fair and honest, a man of honor, and you should be very proud of what you have done for our community. You will be certainly missed. I also want to thank Mrs. Ott Ottman for the fantastic work she has done as the chair of the board these past three years. You have been an extremely great advocate for our kids, professional, prepared, impressive, and balanced. You have especially done incredible work during these unprecedented times. And I am sure you're looking forward to this new chapter of service on the board. I also want to thank the opportunity to thank all our school nurses for the amazing work they're doing for our community. We are forever grateful for the countless hours of work and care you are giving our kids. And lastly, I want to wish everyone good luck in their new roles and a warm welcome to our new board member in this new cycle and thanks. Now let's keep putting kids first, do our best to truly be transparent and work together. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Magui. Louise Ruiz, you are unmuted. And recognized. Oh, it says I'm. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Um, okay, so you'll just have to um, view because I you don't have them viewing. We can anymore. hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Mr. Deneen, congratulations on becoming the Board of Education new chairperson. Thank you. Um, I agree with you that we do have the best group of professional administrators in our town um, running our school system. I'm glad you acknowledge that. I also agree that Tara Ockman was a formidable, formidable chairwoman. And in my mind, there was no reason for us to change the, cha the chair position, especially during a pandemic. But here we are. I would also like to thank Mike Burke. Mike Burke, as other people have said before me, that he, um, he will leave a gaping hole in the Board of Education. His knowledge around policy, his knowledge around negotiating teacher contracts and his ability to reach across the aisle will also be missed. I would like to share something with the Board of Education members that are fortunate enough to be representing all of our constituents currently. We are all known by our deeds. Um, and by that, I'd like to share a story with all of you. 
And here's an example of what I'm talking about. Five people go on an, on an annual vacation and each spring they hold a meeting to decide where they're going to go and how much they're going to spend on that vacation. This year, unfortunately, four of those friends decided to meet without the fifth. How does that leave the fifth person feeling? I, for one, would never participate in a meeting that excluded one of my friends or a fellow board member. And I would actually stand up and say to those other board members, I'm not willing to participate and I urge you not to participate. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about deeds. We are watching very carefully. We will continue to watch very carefully. I expect every Board of Education member to leave their political affiliation at the door when they walk into a board meeting. You are representing all board persons' children, all constituents' children. When we in town give advice to each other's children, whether it be about going to college or whether it be finding a job, we don't only select those people that we wish are affiliated with our own parties. We don't only wish to share advice and goodwill with those people. We share we're, it. We're almost at time, Mrs. Wayland. Thank you. We share it generously. I urge every Board of Education member to share yourselves generously. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Wayland. User Ted and Erica Radomer, you are unmuted and recognized. Thank you. This is Erica Radormer at Three Riviera Road in town. Um, first of all, thank you to the administration. Thank you to the teachers. Thank you so much to the nurses who are so carefully tracking and keeping everyone safe. Um, as a mother of a kindergartner, a second grader, and a third grader, I was concerned when I received the materials on Friday with the new plans. I, I just don't frankly see how a five, seven, and eight-year-old are going to be able to sit in front of a screen all day and turn it off and turn it back on with a lot of parent intervention. That being said, I don't know if there's a plan for an update as far as numbers are, as far as, you know, they're looking at schools within themselves. Is that going to be considered? So I was just wondering, is there a time that we will give an update on the numbers that we currently have? And if they continue, you know, what we can expect? I think as a parent, I just feel a little in the dark when I get these emails and a little concerned. And I think it would be reassuring if we had an update to say, here's where our numbers are, you know, here's what will happen if we get to a certain point. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. There are no more raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, on to the superintendent's report, Dr. Adler. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to people tuning in this evening. Uh, may I just lead off by uh, offering my own congratulations to those around the table. I'm um, appreciation uh, to the board, uh, my board chair, uh, previous board chair, Ms. Hockman, uh, for your support and leadership. Uh, it's commendable and very much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, I do want to also recognize our staff uh, this evening uh, for their continued uh, heroic work and uh, tireless efforts. Uh, certainly our, our, our health and wellness staff in particular, uh, led by Alicia, um, has done a phenomenal job uh, keeping us in school. Every, every day that we by in school is, is a blessing in many ways. Um, but, but certainly uh, we also appreciate uh, the climate within which we're working. Uh, there's a, there's, there is certainly um, reason for, for to be anxious and it's certainly challenging along the way. But again, we, we, we uh, commend them uh, for their efforts I do want to also recognize our parents of the high school this morning. Uh, we've been in this seat before. And as I said before, uh, we would do every, everything we can uh, to give as much notice, whether it was the night before um, or whether it's at the same time we call a snow day at 5 or 5.30. Uh, that was not the case this morning because that was not the case whenever we learned about the uh, COVID case this morning. And so the team uh, collectively was apprised at 6.30. 
and it was thereafter that, that we had to uh, quickly uh, make some conclusions and uh, finally make a call. Uh, we will always err on the side of safety, safety and abundance of caution. And but I do appreciate the fact that our our, our staff are responding so quickly. Our 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 students are terrific um, in doing so, and also our parents. Um, I understand it's a disruption. It's not something you're planning for, but I appreciate um, the tolerance of the inconvenience thus far uh, as we try and keep our students in in, in school and, and keep everybody safe. Uh, it's to everybody's advantage. Uh, that we be conservative in these things as, as much as we can. And we'll continue to try and give people as much notice as we can. Certainly it's not something we'd like to do at that time, um, but in this case, it was necessary. And once once again, uh, the people are very adept at making that change. So again, uh, thank you for our staff, uh, our students uh, and our parents uh, for making that accommodation today. I want to thank Mr. Tramberg uh, for organizing with his staff. Um, and as a company and staff, uh, the November 3rd Professional Development Day, uh, we did do that remotely. It was a, a very well received day of professional development that ranged from uh, training in, in Chromebooks, Seesaw, Math and Focus, co teaching, uh, DBT training, and a variety of other trainings. Um, uh, so, congratulations on that. It's not, uh, it's not easy to plan the staff to plan a complete remote day, and it was received very well. We did receive uh, the desk shields, and uh, those will be those are now down in the elementary school to be used as uh, additional mitigation strategies. Northeast Collaborative um, has revised its draft of the of the um, draft plan feasibility plan for the removal of the portables, the libraries you mentioned, and also the um, classroom space. Uh, so that will be presented at Thursday mornings and discussed again at Thursday mornings facilities committees and it's, it's exciting to, to see that topic uh, move forward. I want to congratulate some of our third graders uh, who were recently recognized in the Darien Times um, for their persuasive essays uh, around uh, being able to wear uh, unit, uh, outfits for, for Halloween um, for um, Mrs. Stroller and um, they were very persuasive because they, they got their way. It was, and it was also nice to see a different topic other than COVID in the front page of, of, <laughs> of, the, of the Darien Times. Thank you. Uh, the, the Connecticut Department, of, as I think most of you know, the Connecticut Department of Education has approved the use of snow days uh, for remote learning. I just apprised people that um, the community, just to give a heads up, uh, the first day that there is a snow day called, all things being equal, that will be a snow day. Whether you're in school, a hybrid, or you are out of school, it will be a snow day. Thereafter, uh, there'll be remote learning days. There's no perfect sense yet. Um, I think. Trying to give everybody just the experience. Uh, no need to pull everything away. Um, I don't think it's the end of the world for, for one for one day. Uh, so if we do have a snow day, um, people will be put on notice at least to, to what they expect. So with that, uh, we are working with the Thriving Youth and the Community Fund uh, to administer uh, the Youth Asset Survey. That's a survey that has been administered here uh, several times. Uh, we are working with them supportively and we'll go through methodically uh, the intention is probably in the springtime, so we've got a work still to do, and uh, we, we thank uh, the Thriving News for, for working with us in that capacity. Uh, I did mention a wee bit earlier on, uh, just that the contract trace, or sorry, the, the uh, cleaning at the weekend has particularly been well received by the staff, and I want to thank the board for, for, for providing that additional service. Um, it's been particularly helpful as, as the COVID cases have increased. Uh, the bids for Arch Ridge, have come in. Uh, they we did receive last week the notification that from the State Department that the bids can be awarded, and it looks like uh, we'll become slightly under budget. Transportation study um, with bus logistics is well underway, so we we anticipate bringing that uh, forward to the board in a couple of weeks. And there's a variety of scenarios that they've looked at uh, regarding that bus and channels. Budget uh, planning is well underway. Uh, two weeks have basically gone by, and uh, we're actually winding down. The, um, budget meetings with uh, our respective RCs and in some ways winding up again to, to uh, put the, uh, the complete budget together, but um, we're, we're well on our way uh, with budget planning. Strategic planning, uh, just slow, just a tad. Um, uh, the staff have to complete some of the strategic action plans and the metrics to bring back before the board. Uh, so we'll re-engage in that. Uh, that needs to take place before the board does its workshop 
um, but we'll plan accordingly to make sure that, that, that we get this completed um, on, a, on a fairly tight schedule here. Uh, now that um, the board has had an opportunity to see the draft thus far, but completing some of that work, uh, first of all, will, will be helpful to the process. And again, it's appropriate that we just take a wee bit of a pause. Uh, tomorrow's Veterans Day, and in the craziness of everything that's going on, it's certainly very appropriate um, uh, that we remember the sacrifices and service of our uh, service men and women, and that the schools will be through a remote processes and other processes um, and activities uh, celebrating and honoring our veterans uh, tomorrow. And with that, those are my announcements. Thank you, Dr. Adley. Uh, next, uh, approval of minutes. Um, I would like a motion to approve the minutes of the special meeting of the Board of Education Tuesday, October 27th, 2020. Uh, Mrs. Stein, second by Mr. Maroney. All in favor? Thank you. That's yeah. unanimous. I'm going to be abstaining. Yeah, other than Sarah will abstain. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for keeping me on. Um, a motion to approve the, mean, the minutes of the regular meeting of the Board of Education meeting Tuesday, October 27th. I have a motion to approve those minutes. Mr. Maroney and uh, Mrs. Ritchie, um, all approved with Sarah as abstaining. Thank you. On to board committee reports. No board committee reports at this time. The Allen gave a brief update on the Oxridge, the next Oxford building committee meeting to go over uh, some bids and do some updates. Right now uh, should be Monday, November 16th at 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. Yes. I was just wondering if we could get an update on the communications committee working group. Has that met? And what, do we know, does, does anyone have an update for that? No. I do not. Okay. Dennis, do you have the working group met, but we have not formulated anything that yet to bring back to the board. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. On to presentations and discussions. Uh, Dr. Adley, update on the uh, school opening. Thank you, um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Kennefeck, our, our medical advisor. Actually, uh, I don't know if he's on. I think he had to just uh, leave for another meet at eight o'clock. So if he's if he's here, thank you for being here, sir. If you're not, uh, we understand that uh, you had to step out for another meeting. So I, I just sort of uh, with this presentation, um, sort of just the last couple of presentations have been rather lengthy. So I'm just going to cut to the chase a little bit and then. Uh, if you don't mind, respectfully open the floor for, for questions and comments. Um, I'll try and cover most of the main areas that I think we, uh, we need to cover. Um, but I think I think it'll be helpful just to maybe get, get to the issues and concerns that uh, board members are uh, on behalf of community and community members have. So uh, the first one is the increased uh, COVID cases. And so as you have been observing, the number of COVID cases through the communications and the news and so on and so forth. I mean, they are steadily increasing. So that's something that uh, we have to be uh, very careful of. Uh, we work very closely with our liaison officer and our medical advisor and the, the town health director. These are the numbers that some people on, on who are watching uh, perhaps were asking for. And so this is kind of where we are at the moment. The cumulative quarantine is, you know, nearly 450 uh, students. The current cases are 23. This was accurate as of end of the day yesterday. It does not include this morning. Um, I understand that the, that that real time would be like like immediate real time. <laughs> uh, sometimes literally you just have to come up for air and calibrate a wee bit um, just to make sure it's accurate. So I, I understand I ask for people's just uh, patience and understanding of that. Um, because it can get it can get very complex very very quickly, and uh, I'd rather would rather be right than 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 not. Uh, so you can see the current cases that we have is 23. Uh, I did have a request about whether we post this on the website. Uh, the Department of Public Health is not recommending that. Uh, State Department of Public Health actually I'm sharing it here, and I'm perhaps opened Pandora's box a little bit the last time I shared it, and I'm sharing it again. Um, but I would ask for that for our communities understanding that it's not going to be shared on our district dashboard. The dashboard will show 
what it currently shows. Um, the reason being, um, more it's more a privacy issue um, given the size of our district. Uh, but the department, again, the Department of Public Health is uh, not recommending that. So, um, sort of uh, privacy sort of outweighs the the right to know, so to speak. Um, but you can see and sort of deduce quickly kind of uh, the patterns uh, that are happening at the moment. The State of the Union for, for locally, uh, Darianne has uh, 36 cases, which pushes us over the sort of general uh, benchmark, which is really 10 cases per 100,000. Uh, you know, we're, we're 21, 22,000 uh, population. So uh, for Darianne, that's uh, about 30 cases puts you over, over the 10 per 100,000, basically. Uh, so we're at uh, 36. This is published. Uh, Every Thursday, um, I will be honest, and we'll be very keen to look what this number is uh, because we have ours and the, the, the time director of health reports what he has to report. Uh, so it'll be very, very interesting to see where we are um, on Thursday with this doc, with this uh, graphic. You can see around us, we're sort of surrounded a wee bit. Um, but fortunately, um, fortunately, uh, we, we've been fortunate to this point actually. Um, this is this is kind of what we're seeing in, in Connecticut. The, all of the, across Connecticut is increasing. Fairfield County is in red, so it's hit the twenty the twenty five per hundred thousand. Uh, you can see over the last couple of weeks, how Fairfield has continued. Uh, the county has continued to increase. Uh, so locally, in Darien, we're we've just gone into the orange area, and we've also gone into the red area uh, for Fairfield. So those are two indicators that. Uh, our medical professionals look at, our staff looks at, I look at, um, they are important indicators. If you remember, uh, they're not now just yellow, green, yellow, bright red, it's, it's, it's not a just, okay, well, that's, that's, a, that's the indicator we're gonna do something different. Clearly, I will say this, if we go red, red, we're doing something. Like, that's, that, that's probably just common sense, right? Um, and that's not the only time we, we might uh, do something. Uh, these are some of the these are some of the questions we could be asking ourselves as we are in either uh, locally in a red or locally in an orange. And these are the conversations that we have uh, with our medical advisors. And we talk regularly, nearly 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 daily at this point uh, around these particular issues. So. I understand uh, some questions that, that sort of ensue are, well, when, it, when's the, when is the decision going to be made? Is it a tipping point? Like what's the, what's the magic number? Um, well, I will say the red, red, that, 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 that's going to sort of uh, speak for itself a little bit. Um, we will continue to monitor this. There are a variety of issues that are at play right now. It's not only the numbers. If you remember back to the State Department when they issued one of some of the addendums, it also talked about attendance issues. It, it also talked about the ability to cohort. It also talked about the ability uh, to mitigate along the way. So all of those things um, are concerning. Uh, we have right now uh, a lot of administrators, principals, so on, covering classes. Uh, so if the attendance of students become a, a significant issue, or if we see people trying to come back with, uh, a number of people coming back, trying to come back with, um, uh, some of the indicators, uh, sickness indicator, illness indicators, um, that, that's a concern. If we can't cover classes, that's going to be a concern. Uh, if we can't deliver what we need to deliver, that will be an issue. So all of those factors sort of uh, we're watching very, very carefully. Uh, so it's something that may well change. Um, and I'm just, I'm just looking at this ever so carefully every day at this particular point. Um, I have to feel that on, uh, for the district, for our children, and for our staff members, that they're safe, right? I mean, that's the predominant thing that I have to feel comfortable with. Uh, we, ha we have been working with our medical advisor and uh, director of health. I don't know if Tim, is Tim there just for a second? If he is, I'll let him come on for a minute. If not, so some of the, so some of the things that we do know- I am here. Oh, you are there. Yep. Uh, Dr. Kennefeck, I, I, wanna, I wanna thank you for uh, all of your help. Um, I don't think David's here, but also uh, David. 
uh, for all of his help along the way. Uh, so you might be helpful for uh, for some of the questions that we'll answer here. Um, we do know that the younger uh, children are less likely to acquire and transmit uh, the COVID. So uh, those are important factors for us as we go along the way. Um, the risk factor for faculty is lower. Um, and it's, it's significantly higher for educationally uh, for, for the younger kids. So we, those are things that uh, we sort of uh, keep, keep in mind. We have not yet seen the spread of, of COVID in the schools from one of our contacts and uh, Dr. Canepec can, can talk to that. Those are some of the reasons that why we're currently still in at the moment uh, in that particular mode. But uh, with the assistance of, of our colleagues here, uh, we're, we're just monitoring this uh, very, very uh, carefully. I am going to, uh, if, with, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, um, not go any further because I, I don't want to uh, keep Dr. Kenneth all night. I know he's got another meeting. And mm -hmm. if there are questions from the board members pertaining to contact tracing, anything, other questions, uh, there's an opportunity here. Alicia is also here um, to, to answer some questions. Good. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Dr. Kenneth. I'll open it up to board questions. Uh, Mrs. Stein. Good evening. Um, I just have a question as we've gotten a lot of feedback on the quarantine. From your medical professional perspective, is there any, are you hearing anything or seeing anything about 14 days and quarantining? We do get a lot of pushback, obviously. And since we're not seeing spread in schools, a lot of parents are, you know, questioning the 14 days and it's hard. It's stressful on anyone, but I'm just wondering if there are any medical updates or CDC updates to that effect. Um, no, the, the current guidance is still 14 days um, because you can document viral shedding and the possibility of contagion for, for that long, uh, potentially even longer for people who are very sick, which fortunately we really haven't um, seen, but people who are hospitalized may shed the virus for even, even longer periods of time. Uh, but 14 days is, is the current uh, guidance. Um, sometimes it's longer though, which is a problem for families with young children, because if a young child is exposed, uh, the quarantine for the other family members starts when that child is no longer contagious. Uh, so it can be even longer than 14 days uh, because it's not possible to lock your you know, first grader in the basement and not be exposed to them uh, for the 10 days that they may be contagious. Um, so uh, if 14 days seems to be the standard um, and we haven't seen any change in that in, in quite some time. Yes, Dr. I just wanted to mention, I'm sure Dr. Kanifek will support this. What we are seeing right now is that the spread is primarily in the community through group, uh, people gathering together group activities. And you may say, well, look, listen, that's okay. You have to do something. If you want the kids to be in school, you need to curtail, we need our, 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 our community to curtail those, those activities. It, it, it's exactly working against the, the children who are in, in school and it's working against um, keeping those kids in school. It's not being supportive of, of the teaching staff in some ways when we do that. So I would just implore people, um, if, if you want the, your children to be in school, then you need to be very careful and and, and exercise the practices that you should be exercising. And I think we all know what they are, but we just can't help ourselves sometimes. Uh, but it's important that, that we really try or else um, it's going to impact the ability to stay in school. It just is. Mr. Brown, did I see your hand? Yeah, I just I had a question for Katie uh, regarding the 14 days, just call to Katie's question. Uh, I guess New York has gone to a five day. Uh, it is shortened from 14 to five. I don't know if there's any talk of Connecticut following that lead. Is a question was posed to me. Well, that would probably be a question for DPH, but um, the, the current guidelines from the CDC are 14 days. There's a good reason for that because if someone's exposed on day one, they typically won't even develop symptoms for anywhere from two to 14 days. So five days would be very little time for, for a contact. Um, five days from the onset of symptoms uh, is still very uh, close to viral shedding decreases in sick people. Um, I, I would say that uh, the current guidance from, from all competent authorities is 14 days for quarantine and 10 days for symptoms. That's from the CDC and from the Department of Public Health. I'd also like to, to reiterate what, what Dr. Adley just said, which is that 
most of the exposures we are seeing are from community social activities and youth sports. Uh, the schools are not at the present a big driver for infection, either for community spread or spread within the schools. Um, and I really urge all the families out there to be very mindful of their activities if they value in-person learning, because these cases are making it more and more challenging. Uh, and certainly the case rates are gonna rise in Connecticut over the next uh, several weeks, um, uh, probably exponentially looking at the shape of the curve. Um, and we, we've been a little bit complacent over the summer because we enjoyed very low uh, infection rates and test positivity rates in Connecticut. Uh, and now they're all starting to, to rise as expected in the fall. Um, but if I would urge people if school is important to make that a priority, which means limit activities where you may be exposed to COVID outside of school. Um, if sports is important, then limit uh, contact during those sporting activities and outside of those sporting activities um, to, to really preserve uh, that opportunity for, for, uh, for sports. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, the, I guess the good news is that the schools are not driving community infections and are not driving infections in the school, uh, but community activities may affect our ability to, to maintain in-person learning. Uh, so I really urge families to be very mindful of, of activities and, um, and, you know, every time you take a small risk, you take a small risk. If you do it 20 times a week, it's no longer a small risk. Um, with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Mr. Brown. You have another yeah, just, just another quick question, maybe more to Alicia. Um, the quarantine numbers that we have, are we doing a follow-up as to what the positivity rate is of those who are quarantining for contact tracing? Um, I don't have a positivity rate, but I can say that we are not seeing kids that we have quarantined, um, test positive in quarantine so far. We've had, we, from school exposure, we are having a few that have had social interactions that have been quarantined, um, outside of school or, or through, um, you know, other activities we've seen a few kids test positive after that, but not from the students that sit around you, you know, sit around people in the classroom or teachers that have quarantined due to an exposure to a student who tested positive. We aren't seeing them um, test positive. But now that I've said that, like any good sports jinx, I may have, we'll see that change tomorrow, <laughs> so. I'll hope not, but thank you very much for this. Any other board questions? Mr. Sini? Maybe Alicia, if you could walk through the um, tracing process, some of the questions came up, you know, how far your tracing goes from the, from the schools when you, you find out a student or staff member uh, are positive. And then when does the town get involved? Um, and so maybe you could help us where the boundaries lie, if you will. Okay, um, so we are, when we get notified of a case, generally we're notified before the state is notified by, by the reporting um, delays that happen. So we get that information. Uh, we ask a lot of questions of the family, you know, if they've had symptoms when those started, when the last day was they were in school, which we of course then check against our attendance records. Um, and then you know, gathering information from the case about who they've been around, if they're involved in any outside activities, um, you know, beyond the school day, and if they've had the occasion to be out at a social gathering or whatever, and try to get as much information as we possibly can. And then we begin our in-house contact tracing by looking at class schedules, uh, seating charts, speaking with teachers about their interactions with students, and, um, and trying to also look at other areas where a student might have been, whether it be a library or a testing center or getting extra help or special services, that kind of thing. So we look at, try to really look at all that information. And then we make a list of the students that need to be quarantined. Oh, I didn't even mention the bus, but we look at the bus, if they've ridden a bus um, or if they've carpooled, who was in their carpool. So we look at all that, we make a list of the contacts and then we start contacting them. We've had to kind of change that contact from a phone call to an email with a confirm requesting a confirmation just because 
we we would have had to make I don't know over a hundred calls this weekend, and um, just not there's just not enough time to do it. And also, you know, if you're the first person called, great. If you're the one hundredth person called, not not so great. Um, so we're trying to trying to change that process a little bit. Um, and then when we find out that a student is on, um, whether it's a student, usually it would be a student who's on a team outside of school, we um, share that information with the health department to then go do that contact tracing outside. But we have had the occasion where people have shared with us or we've been able to get in touch with the team uh, to get that roster to be able to go ahead and quarantine the kids that are on that team to keep them out of school. So we really try to stay in the school building, but also knowing that kids outside of school have interacted with the positive case and trying to also not have them return to school, um, you know, if it happens over the weekend or the next day based on if they were in a practice or, uh, you know, game or whatever tournament outside of school. Um, but then we turn that information over to the health department and then they have their own system of you know doing contact tracing and sometimes due to personnel and things like that that gets left to the state that information gets entered and gets left to the state but we are trying to refine that process with the town um, i've had several conversations with david Knoff um, about how to do that and i know they're working on getting additional support so that we can turn our lists over and have them continue to follow up with families uh, that are, need to be in quarantine and then do the outside contact tracing to uh, other individuals in the town of Darien. I've had the occasion where I've talked to a couple of parents that are parents of students that are at private schools and, you know, just giving them the information, but I can't, I have no authority over whether or not they go to school or not on Monday morning. So. So thank you very much. That was an awesome explanation. So your, your focus is basically students and staff of the Darien Public School District. Right. And they might step out of bounds, if you will, outside the district because of teams and such, but then it almost cut, does a U-turn and comes back within the schools because many of those teammates are probably students of the Darien School District. Correct. So, right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Ritchie. Thank you, Alicia, for everything you're doing. So much appreciate it. I know how hard everybody is working. Um, what I wanted to know is what, I've heard some rumors about some students not maintaining their quarantine, and I hope that's not true, but what measures do we have in place, and I don't know who, exactly who this is for, but what measures do we have in place to ensure that a student or staff remains in their quarantine and doesn't return to school before that period is over? So when we move students to quarantine and they're moved to remote learning, the teachers are aware that, you know, the date that they are going to be out until so if a student were to return before that date, it gets questioned. And, um, and then we make sure that the student, um, we would make sure the student goes home. But we, we really have not had that here in the school. We haven't had that where we've had to send somebody home because they came out of quarantine. Um, I think that there is some concern about people going out of quarantine and into public settings and that's a little bit more difficult but we do send a communication um, that ex when we when we talk to families we explain what quarantine means but we also send a communication that has that information in it very um, clearly states that you know if you're in quarantine you're to remain at home um, and stay you know in your home if you have a child you know young kids where you can go outside but in your yard not with other children um, they can't go to the park. You're not supposed to go to your sports practices. Um, you're supposed to remain in quarantine for the 14 days. Um, you know, don't accompany, they can't accompany a parent to the grocery store, that kind of thing. They're supposed to stay home. Um, and we've answered a lot of questions about that, but if people are not uh, following the quarantine, that's hard for us to kind of manage outside the school setting. Thank you. Mr. Maroney. Yeah, so um, contact tracing seems very, very labor intensive. To me, this just begs the point that we can use technology to help in contact tracing. I've done a little reading that there are certain states that are now trying to roll this out. They haven't had a lot of, of buy-in from, from citizens to do it, but have we thought about using technology, especially at middle and high school, where basically every child, every student has a phone on them 
to help with contact tracing. Actually, the state of Connecticut's, I think, rolling something out on Thursday. Uh, they have a contact tracing app for iOS and Android. Uh, so that, that is actually being released. There are some disadvantages to those because in, when you have a multi-story building, um, it doesn't necessarily know that you're within uh, you know, six feet in what direction. Uh, but it is, it, it, it is useful the, the, and it sends a notification, but I think our notifications have to be much more specific to families and children and also uh, contain some education. So it will help, um, but um, uh, it, it's not a perfect uh, solution, but it does help you know, give us, uh, it, it will notify other contacts that they've been in contact uh, while still maintaining some privacy. Ms. Karen. Thank you. So I read earlier this week that there are some districts and schools in Connecticut that have received some federal and state funding for testing. And I know earlier this year you've said that that um, Darian, the idea of testing is not right for Darian. I'm just curious if there's any more thought around that idea. I don't know if that was directed uh, to me. <laughs> yes, since we talked about it, you can take it, Doctor. That's fine. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks. Uh, yes, uh, Connecticut has received um, a whole bunch of the the new rapid antigen tests that the federal government ordered. Um, one of the challenges with with that test is that it, it's never been tested in children. It's only been tested in a hundred people. Uh, though, though we do have 150 million test units ordered, so the data is somewhat lacking. One of the problems with rapid testing is that it is not nearly as accurate as the gold standard, which is PCR testing, which typically takes a couple of days to get the results. Rapid antigen testing works best with frequent testing. Um, and one of the problems is a negative test doesn't always, especially in people without symptoms, doesn't rule out positivity. Uh, some of these antigen tests have a 30% uh, false negative rate. Um, so. They work very well with captive populations like college campuses that are closed or like the NBA uh, where you have closed uh, populations in an open school community, um, the, the testing has its limits uh, unless we do it very frequently. Then we run into logistical issues is how do we test all these kids without lining them up and exposing other kids to other kids. Um, so that's what one of the reasons the CDC hasn't recommended, especially for, for public schools, uh, mass testing. I mean, in a perfect world, we test every human being in the United States every day, uh, but we, we're a, a long way from that uh, uh, perfect world. Um, so we'll have to see what the data shows on the accuracy and usefulness of this test as it's rolled out. Um, several of us were on a call this morning with the State Department of Education and Department of Public Health. I think so far the new test has been used in 11 patients, uh, but we're, we're waiting to see what the, the data uh, comes, but sadly, mass screening testing is not always very practical for for the public school scenario. Thank you. Any other further, Mr. Cena? Just, just one follow up to Dr. Adley. You, you had to keep in mind, kind of asterisk comment about you know K through six children being at lesser risk than the older children, and I, maybe I missed it. But are you basically saying that the, the district is equipped? to handle, you know, the elementary schools differently than the middle school and the high school, perhaps, uh, you know, in terms of opening or the models that we're, we're following? It may well be, and there's, and certainly those are discussions that we have had and continue to have. It may well be, in, in all full transparency, that um, there may be an opportunity to do that, uh, while the data suggests that it might be doable, um, and that might be sooner than later. Um, to, to make that transition to something like that. If, if, honestly, I fear if we wait too long, that'll be impossible to do that. But, but if I, I fear if we wait too long, potentially, um, that we won't have the opportunity to bring the kids in and keep them in, the younger children. Go on with that, if you could just give us a little more color on that comment. I, I would just say at this point, we're looking at all the options for our early childhood. What people want us to look at is our, our most neediest students who are in many ways our early childhood students as they're another model to do that and uh, we've had those conversations and that may well be a possibility thank you this is awesome uh just clarify sorry i don't know how this one works 
There's no button. Oh. Um, just to clarify, Dr. Adley, are what you're saying is we will keep children in school as long as it is safe to be in school. And that might be different for high school or middle school or elementary, but you will make those decisions based on what is in the interest of public health and safety. That is correct. And uh, th those are positions that uh, Dr. Kennefet and, and uh, David Knopf has, uh, have supported. So that I've, often said, I've always said that the, uh, the health and safety through our experts is, is a critical input into it. So, so yes. Thank you. This is again. Well, we need to, we need to talk about it in the sense of uh, what Elisa just talked about of where where the lines of deep what demarcation are. If the town can help uh, with it, with additional resources on their side of things, is very helpful. Um, but Lisa saying we we can provide more help and that's useful. And our nurses are stepping up and they are helping out. Right? And I think we have a process in place there. It just doesn't take take away the time consuming part that if I may talk to Alicia, she talks to me, I talk to her, she talks to uh, principals, I talk to principals, she talks to everybody. She probably repeats herself 30 times. Uh, and whether you have 50 people or, or five people, that, that task still has to take place. So a lot of that burden uh, does fall upon her as she coordinates uh, with her medical advisors and so on. Um, I do think that uh, looking at some of the processes which Alicia has alluded to uh, will help us. There are some things that we're realizing that if we had this in this format, uh, we might be able to access a wee bit easier and more seamlessly, whether it's in a technology format or not, Dennis. Uh, so I think I think that's kind of where we are with it. And I don't think we need a, a like another cadre of, of nurses to do it. I don't think that's gonna help, to be honest with you. I think on the other side of the, of the time, though, it would, uh, additional assistance would help there. And in turn, that's gonna help us. Any other board questions? Sorry, Mrs. Richie. So I was wondering if you could touch on the um, number of hours. I don't know. If can, can, may I just, just with the doctor? Oh, do we want to? Okay, so we're going to finish up with him. Okay. Just, he's yeah, kind, he's kind enough to join us this evening. Right, absolutely. Are we good with Dr. Kennefer? Right, just one question. So, sure, Mrs. Dr. Kennefer, it, it doesn't necessarily come down to a particular number of cases, short of us being in a red zone, as much as it comes to both a balance between school management and, and the health situation, or, or is there any, I'm getting a lot of questions just from constituents of, is there a line in the sand? Or is this really, while we're still kind of in the orange zone, a management issue? Well, I guess the answer, as I get older, I find the answer to every either or question is like, yes. Uh, <laughs> so, I appreciate that. Yeah, um, so what we all look at many factors. I would say if you want to look at the, the sort of the biggest picture that, you know, that, that I can sort of draw for you, th the number one reason to consider, um, uh, you know, reducing uh, all kinds of community gatherings, including school, is to preserve healthcare capacity until we can get the pandemic under control. The good news in Connecticut is we still have healthcare capacity. Um, that is the one thing that might uh, drive, you know, our, our statewide leaders to, to take action if they fear a surge. So regardless of our local conditions, that might sort of trump everything we're doing here if, if, the, if the healthcare system in our locality is suffering serious strain. Um, the, the, the other big picture I can offer is that, that COVID is quite different than influenza. Influenza, the schools have a tremendous impact on community spread. Um, everyone who has a child who's been to the pediatrician's office probably knows that already. Uh, COVID is not a pediatric disease. And we are beginning to find the data from Europe and other parts uh, do, do not show that schools really contribute hugely to community spread. Uh, that's really good news for, for families and children. Uh, young children in particular seem much less likely to get COVID, much less likely to get serious symptoms. In fact, they're almost unheard of in kids under 10. Um, there's also was a great study from Yale that was released recently, unfortunately not with elementary school, but with preschool workers 
uh, and they found that they were no more likely to get COVID while working than they were in the community. So that being around young children didn't seem to increase their risk of contracting disease. And that bears what our data is showing here in the community, which is that the schools are not contributing hugely to spread of COVID. Even the cases we see within the school are from outside of the school setting for the most part, uh, activities like social events with families, and uh, youth sports uh, where kids, kids congregate. The mitigation strategies that we have in place in the school seem to be very successful. So there, is, there are numbers published by the state that would uh, ask us to consider using, uh, lowering the density in the schools by, by converting more to hybrid or more remote learning. And that number, as you probably all know, is, is 25 cases per 100,000 average over the last 14 days. Um, it's not a mandate. So a lot of it depends on the other conditions. Are we seeing people getting sick? Are we seeing the schools uh, acting as a source of community transmission? Are the uh, staff members or students getting sick? Uh, as well as, as that number. So there's a whole host of factors we're looking for. Um, certainly the American Academy of Pediatrics of which I'm a member really favors in-person learning, especially for younger children where possible because the risk of COVID to them is very low but the, we must balance the risks to the staff and faculty and keep them protected. And the, the good news I can say from, from the global sort of context we're, the, we're looking at now is that the risk to the faculty is, is not um, uh, much higher than just living in the community. Uh, so that uh, now that may change as COVID rates rise in our community and we're, we see more community spread, uh, but it, it's still very safe to be in school. And I think that's, that's most important. And we, we look at that, that data. So there's no one trigger because we're looking at a whole host of factors. Uh, certainly the rates in the community are one of the most important uh, statistics that we look at and pieces of data, but we're also looking at what role the, the, the uh, school has in sort of local and, and spread within in the community. So I, I hope that addresses some of your questions. I wish I could give you, there's a simple answer where we pull the trigger uh, but I don't think it's quite that that simple. Um, no, that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board questions? No. I would just, Mr. Maroney. Yeah. So just a question. I'm hearing about youth sports, and and my question is, youth sports went on all during the summer, and we didn't see this same spike. So why are we seeing a spike now with youth sports? Uh, rates are higher in the community, and cold weather seems to favor COVID spread. Um, I, th that's my guess, but th the fact is we're seeing it. Um, so um, it, it's uh, most, uh, a good percentage of the cases we've seen in the schools have been from, from youth sports. Um, it's definitely, one of the problems is because of the nature of sports, because kids are unmasked in close proximity, one positive person on a team usually uh, quarantines the whole team because it's so hard to, to be sure that someone was effectively distant. Also, because m many of the players are unmasked and basically face to face, um, you probably all know that we use this sort of 15 minute per 24 hour uh, guideline, but it only takes a second if you're face to face with someone. Uh, so youth sports do, do pose a risk, some sports more than others, which have really close contact. Um, other sports, not so much at all. Uh, but all I can say is this is just what we're observing in the community. Um, and we could speculate as to all the reasons why, but it's at, at the moment, it's an observed uh, set of data. Any other questions for Alicia or Dr. Kennefack? Thank you both for joining us this evening. We appreciate it. We appreciate all the information. Thank you, Dr. Kennefack. Thank you. Take care. The, Be uh, safe. Thank, thank you. you. The, the recap I got from that was the, the reinforcement and I think a great communication went out um, in conjunction with the district and the town on what we need to do out in social situations in terms of distancing and paying attention to what we're doing in the community. I don't think the beautiful weekends that we have help, but I think we have to stay vigilant. The passion in this town is to have our students in classes. I think this is a good reminder of how we can go about doing that. Um, Mrs. Ritchie, I know you had a question about uh, days, Dr. Adler. Right, I just wanted if we could go over what you had received as an update in terms sure. of hours. Um, I, uh, um, last week, I received the confirmation that the expectation uh, remains the same. 
I will say this, it's a very understandable and reasonable question from community members. It's an absolutely ridiculous response back from the State Department of Education, who have honestly, it, it, the quality of education that our young people are receiving here through what your staff is doing. And I'm, I don't wanna talk about other districts, okay? But when I'm just talking about the R's of other districts, believe me, I know. It's outrageous that, that, that they are holding firm on this expectation in a health pandemic and given the quality of education that we're providing. Having said that, that's the answer they give me. Having said that, out of the blue, I got an email before I walked in here, um, which changed the hours. And so they're gonna rule something else, but I don't think it's gonna be, it's gonna be in the 800s somewhere. Uh, so they're gonna, after saying the expectations the same, then I just emailed me and told me that uh, we'll roll it back to some degree. So we'll see what that is. Um, I have no intention, honestly, um, at the moment of making those hours up right now. Uh, there are areas where we could look at PD days that we have, half day Fridays, I don't want to give those up. Uh, asynchronous time for children, I don't want to give children uh, busy work. Uh, that's not what we're about. Perhaps there's opportunities for some of the half days of conferences or otherwise, but that, but, you know, teachers can't do two things. So um, I'm just very disappointed in the State Department, to be honest with you. Um, they're, they're, they're trying to square uh, fit a rift. A round peg in a square hole. Um, but I do understand that it's a very reasonable inquiry, right? Because that's what the law says. Um, I would like someone to show me another district who, who's honoring it anywhere close to where we are. Board questions, Mrs. Oh, Ackley. Sorry. Um, thank you. Um, given that new information that they might roll back, and, and given there's a board mandate in terms of following state statute, I think maybe my suggestion would be for board discussion is to treat this a little bit like our appropriation, manage it, do what's best in the interest of public health and safety. And then if we need to tack on hours, we deal with that as that comes. But if, this, if the state is gonna change hours now, we might find they change hours again. We might find that we need to make a change in the spring when hopefully the curve is different than we're experiencing right now. But um, I'm not sure given the medical update we just got and the map behind you on the wall that I would feel comfortable saying, let's bring more people together for more time. Um, I think maybe we treat it like the appropriation, watch where we are, adjust as we need, but just like we're not saying, you know, we need to get our money right now. We, we, I'm just saying maybe we should be flexible. I, I think it's interesting that the state held to the 900 hours and is now changing the 900 hours. And we don't and, know what uh, level they'll be at yet. And right? in the past, to be perfectly honest with you, as any superintendent across the state, they couldn't have cared less about the 900 hours in the last generation. But that being said, I'm, I'm <laughs> particularly biased and opinionated around our news. <laughs> we, I think we just need to continue this update so mm -hmm. we make sure we're in compliance with our statutory duties. So, could you could you just clarify on the email? And I know it's early, but you, you sense a shift. But you said something in the eight hundred hour. Yes. Thing. So when you get more of an update, I think that would be a perfect opportunity to discuss it again. And sure. I'm, I sh agree. I'm shocked that I that they, they moved at all. Like I mean, after telling me there's no move, but. <laughs> um, and I agree with Ms. Hawkins that absolutely you don't want to increase time in the classrooms now and upset the apple cart by any means, but it's something at some point we might need to address. And we yes. just like the appropriation, we don't want to go too late where we find ourselves scrambling. Yeah, I have to comply, so. So I think it continues to be a top yep. bullet. Continue to monitor state. it. Any other board questions around the school opening? I probably should just take two seconds real quickly sure. on these things, but I'll just right, um, uh, right on dismissal. The place I've been helping is actually is getting better, right? Um, we did have a, a a meeting with the first selectman, um, Ms. Ackerman himself, we talked about, uh, uh, yourself? I think uh, Mr. Denise. Sorry, it was, uh, sorry. Um, about the, the, the traffic and uh, the, the police department issued a, a press alert about it. Uh, they have not been receiving any, any complaints uh, as of recently. Our schools reported that there is a better situation at this point, particularly down at uh, Arts Ridge, so we're making some progress there. Uh, teaching and learning last, uh, in a moment, uh, Chris can touch, touch base with a few comments. Communications, 
I think you under you, you know that we have um, the middle school has is starting to conduct um, went over very well the most recent one uh, planning for transitions to try and give people a anticipate uh, what that might look like. Same thing for elementary school where resources are sent out. So those are some of the communications that are ongoing. The COVID uh, related expenses, we will bring this to the next finance committee. If uh, you may not recall, but the last time uh, we, we in September when we approved uh, transfers and so on, and uh, we discussed the COVID expenses that it was at um, two, three, 2.3 million um, net of the uh, grants and transfers. Uh, today it's sitting at the two four, so basically basically about a, a hundred thousand dollar increase. Uh, it will show when it comes to the finance subcommittee. Uh, there's about eighty six thousand dollars of additional expenses uh, from the swimming, boys swimming YMCA and the gymnastics uh, the YMCA. Uh, those are, those are the main things. There's some minor adjustments uh, for police coverage, uh, additional uh, substitute coverage. So it's a bit of an increase of about a hundred thousand dollars. And that will come through the, the finance uh, subcommittee. I don't, I don't see that. It's, it, it's not. Oh, we don't it's have not, that. No, it's not okay. done anything. Um, athletics, uh, we're winding down. Um, congratulations, field hockey, girls soccer. They're in the semifinals. Volleyball is in the final. Um, I think swimming has got one more meet to go. It's still unclear when winter's starting. Um, there's a meeting on November 17th by the Board of Control. Supposedly, uh, they'll tell us then. Uh, when the winter is going to start and under what conditions, mitigation strategies. Uh, Chris, could you just give a very quick update on, on, on uh, teach and learn from this? Sure. Uh, I'll start with is this on? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, just a shout out to the teachers uh, for as different as schools look, um, their grace and professionalism is amazing. And what they are making look easy as I'm in classrooms, I know is incredibly hard and is taking amazing planning for the, for the work that they're doing. And it's amazing to see. Um, our professional development and evaluation committee is meeting tomorrow to review our feedback from our November 3rd professional development and to identify what we might want to look at for our remaining days for the year. Um, regarding assessment, we do have our fall one assessment data, which was, um, as I've been saying from the beginning, is especially important for our, our young readers. Uh, so typically, uh, we might have one to two students in a class that are not uh, meeting the benchmark for the first window. Um, what we've seen is uh, very roughly, instead of one to two, it's three to four. Those extra students that are not meeting, um, whether through targeted instruction or boost groups, we're seeing in the second fall assessment that they are um, at grade level. So that's exactly what we want to see happen. So through um, just some brief targeted instruction, they're right back where they need to be, which I will say is remarkable and another testament to the work that our teachers are doing. Um, grades three to three to five are performing very similarly to what they have in the past. And um, we are, our pace is slowed down a bit. So in reading and writing, we are about three weeks behind where we would typically be. And again, I would say three weeks is very impressive considering um, the non-traditional <laughs> interference that we've experienced as we've opened the year. Um, as writers, um, the uh, students, our youngest students, uh, doing well with decoding, so looking at words and being able to sound them out, but not necessarily encoding and spelling. Um, so we're targeting instruction there. Um, math is part of our fall two assessment window, so I don't have those benchmarks to report on yet. But basically, uh, uh, fact fluency um, and computational fluency are impacted a bit. So that's just how automatic the math is to students. But again, with targeted instruction, we're seeing some improvements there. And at the secondary level, as I mentioned, and it's not limited to secondary level, it's more of the, the work behaviors, things like self-advocacy, stamina, reading, sustained writing. Um, that's just, for lack of a better description, building up the muscles to be able to do that again, but no giant gaps that uh, department chairs are reporting with, with learning. So that's my very fast overview. Thank you. Any board questions? Mrs. Stein. I have a question, not specifically on curriculum, more about teaching and more logistics and probably better suited for rich and large. Going back to what Dr. Adley said about having administrators covering classes, are we finding an issue getting subs given the districts around us? And can you just speak a little to that, um, what we're doing to try to get subs and how big is the problem? 
I mean, we're, we're trying our best. We call people, we look in Apple track and all us every day, but it's the same throughout Fairfield County. Um, we told told the principals earlier that they could add a, another permanent building sub to try to have more in the stable, but they're just not around. They're not around to have. So everyone's chipping in. Everyone is covering class. And is there any thought to, I know that many college kids may be home for extended periods with free time if they're old enough and qualified, is, is it worth trying to capitalize on that? So the substitute man, te college. a teacher, you have to have a college degree oh, you to do. be in the you class. So it could be a graduate student. Yep, or someone not yet working or whose job is delayed. Yeah, so okay. if you know anyone with a degree, <laughs> I mean, I do sure. think it's worth yeah. calling some ready. And there are people whose jobs have been postponed who have graduated college and are looking for things to do. So I, I think it's worth spreading the word um, to get the word out mm. to help. Yes, we did actually get a couple of paraprofessionals who we were able to hire this year for students who are taking a gap year. That's how we found our lunch monitors. So. It's, that part's getting good. So generally, we're by 10 to 13 percent in absenteeism uh, for any staff members, not just it's just teachers. And we can basically fill basically fill 50 percent of, of the position. So that 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 gives you an indication of the challenge that we have and and what actually people are doing to actually uh, keep continuous learning going on. What is the typical absentee right? Mark, do you have an uh, not for you? Roughly, yeah, this this is, the typical one. It's about 40, 43, 43 staff members, are right? Right. I mean, so so on a bad day, we have probably 30 or 40, 40 out of 800 teachers. Um, and now we're, we can be up much yep. more than that. Thank you. Yeah, 30 or 40. This is Richie. So interestingly enough, I had a few friends mention, parents mentioned to me that if there was a need, they would be willing to step in. So has there been a thought to reaching out to the broader community and letting people know that there is an issue with substitutes and maybe go, reaching into a pool that you never thought that were accessible? Is that possible? So I'm not exactly sure how we could do that, but I think we could ask you if any of those people want to contact my office, we are happy to put them. People substitute in different schools. They can't substitute in the school where their, student, where their children are. But other than that, we would welcome anyone. Is there a specific training that would be needed before they'd be able to be a substitute or what is required? We give some training, but don't worry, they would pass it. Okay, well, that's great. Everybody out there, you heard that. Is there anything to that point we can do, Marge? I'm sure you're doing everything through the website, through recruiting. Right, so, you know, the website, the website is difficult. We post on CT Reap, which is a Connecticut kind of educational website, we haven't found that other outlets are particularly helpful. We've reached out to some of the colleges and, you know, a, a lot recently has been word of mouth from my assistant, Diane Sander, who lives in Darien. She's found people that way. So spread the word, if you would, please. Thank you. Any other board questions? Mrs. Um, Chris, thank you for the teaching and learning update. I'm so excited about that 11-3 training, which, as I recall, is about um, teaching uh, teachers how to do small group work, whether it's cross, you know, to, with some kids who are remotely or just in a, in a classroom where you can't configure the way we used to. Um, I just would love to know, to have that be an ongoing conversation that, that we have the support and the training needed to make sure that can happen. I think we as a district value collaboration. So if we could keep that conversation ongoing, um, please. I think it's exciting. Absolutely. Um, and then I have a, Go ahead, Mrs. Okay. Um, unrelated, um, I'm, it just, this is a, just a request that we also separate out the legal expenses that went, went into the, um, developing the COVID specific policies as the, so that we can see if, if it's possible so that we can see how much money we needed to spend. And then similarly, and probably much less easily, um, I would love to understand, Charlie, at some point, um, how we are tracking COVID related expenses in special education. Yeah. Any further questions from the board around the school opening plan? Thank you all. Uh, we move on to the presentation and discussion of proposed enrollment projections by Malone and McBroom, uh, Mr. Richard Rudel and Mr. Michael Duba. Sure. Uh, we have uh, Mike Duba on Zoom here uh, from all in the room. We'll take us through the enrollment report.
I think he might have lost connection. Okay. Would it make sense to amend the agenda, move on, and come back, or do you think he'll? Are we trying to reconnect with Mr. Zuba? Uh, we are. No. Okay. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the actual the actual gift that might be a quick might be something quick we could accomplish. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. We tried. Sorry, Colleen. <laughs> oh. Sorry, I tried. <laughs> Mr. Zuba, ready? Okay. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Mr. Zuba, can you hear us? I can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Thank you. Maybe a little louder. Mr. Zuba, will you be screen sharing tonight? I will. I had a temporary hiccup, I think, hopefully, in our internet here, but I, now we're back up and running. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share uh, the PDF screen of my presentation. Let me know when you could see it. We are ready. Okay, well, I learned, I'll be honest, I've done a lot of Board of Ed meetings in the last couple of weeks and I've learned a lot listening to your discussion on how you're handling um, you know, the pandemic we're in and um, yeah, it was very insightful, so. Um, for the last hour, I was uh, kind of glued to the screen a little bit. I'm um, just getting a different glimpse of what each, each different district is doing throughout our state of Connecticut. Um, so for tonight's presentation, typical to what we do in the past, we'll go back and take a look at our past modeling performance and figure out what has changed since then and how well we did, and then go through our review that we conduct in the town of our key demographics and our housing I'm an economic drivers and then get into the enrollment trends and then finally into the enrollment projection section of the report. Um, so as we were working towards the October enrollment um, tracking where you're at, as well as a lot of the other districts, um, that's a, a big date for us is that October 1st data point. Um, and what we were seeing is that um, overall, and unfortunately the state didn't release much of the statewide information in time for us to be able to get anything within this report, but some of the trends we were seeing are similar in Darien to some of our other um, Derg A and Derg B district clients. Um, so when we looked at our projections and overall, we were just under 1% on our medium model is the one that we've been tracking with, um, with Darien Public Schools for the last year. Um, it was no surprise to see the kindergarten enrollment number um, lower than we had anticipated um, based on our past history and our current projection. Um, and then also seeing the overall elementary just a little bit lower than where we thought. But um, by and large, we were within that 1%, but the big driver um, was really in that kindergarten number. And that was something that we know we needed to roll, roll our sleeves up on a little bit and dig in a little bit deeper. Um, so what we've been doing this year, and it's a little different than, you know, I'll be honest, something that we've never really done in the past um, is looking back and sort of tracking enrollment and tracking withdrawals or opt-outs um, throughout the course of say the summer and as you move forward into opening and then into when um, the state says that October 1st is really the uh, is the key benchmark for all projections and really all of the uh, statewide planning. Um, we wanted to take back and take a look at what changed over those several months. Um, and then we saw the um, really the, the dip there in some withdrawals from the kindergarten that was in line with what we were seeing in some other communities and then some um, you know, withdrawals overall in the lower elementary. At the middle school, it looked on par with what we've been tracking as well as um, the high school overall, but um, we needed to be able to identify this in order to modify slightly our projection. So, you know, we really don't end up with a little bit of a hole for next year's number. 
Um, and I'll talk through that a little bit greater detail as we work our way through. I'm looking at the state level data. Um, unfortunately, um, the U.S. Census is um, behind and they're counting for 2020. Um, we were hopeful we would have had some preliminary numbers out for the fall. Um, we're hopeful that next summer we'll get the numbers out and then we'll be able to at least have some townwide data. But right now we're working off of estimates of the population. Um, but by and large for Darien, the most recent number is 2019, but the population has been fairly flat at around 21,700, 800 um, residents overall. Um, one of the areas where we do typically rely heavily on that um, demographic data from the state, and um, we've always liked to be able to do um, a demographic birth model, and that's where we take um, the different age cohorts of females of childbearing age and fertility rates and apply those um, going forward to be able to get a good indicator of what your future births are going to look like within your community so we can be able to have kindergarten projections going out in that five to ten year um, window. However, that data wasn't released, so we're still relying on what we've done the last several years is um, really using a mathematical model for that. Um, two of the things I'd like to point out are really in your future kindergarten classes and starting with that 2017 birth year, which is going to contribute to that 2022 kindergarten class. We had a little bit of an uptick there at 215 and then really the 2019 number, um, which is still preliminary in the state size, but it's really good for, for our use now. I'm coming in at 226. Um, that'll contribute to your 2024, 2025 kindergarten classes. Um, so that's a, a, nom, a, a notable uptick over where it's been. And then what we use for 2020 is we have partial year data, and then we estimate the last, um, the last few months based on the historic percentages there, and then really run our regression analysis out from that in order to be able to have a low, medium, and high births. And uh, really the medium is the one that um, you know, we're leaning towards and that's tracking at about 215 to 220 going out to 2025. More and more in um, your community as well as many of our other communities we work in in Fairfield County, the housing market has been such a big part of um, you know, how we're assessing not only um, what the immigration looks like within the schools, but really a, a driver that we're seeing for kindergarten enrollment more so um, than what we used 20, 25 years ago when we really relied heavily on BERTS. Um, best data we had, which was a partial year, January through August for sales through the Warren Group where we purchased the data third party. Um, we're tracking at about 324 sales estimated for the full year. Um, so really a good uptick from where you were at the last two years where you came in at just around 270 sales. Um, looking at the year to date two for the median sale price, you're at a pretty recent high there of about 1.4 million, um, really indicating that there's a lot of competition in the local market there, um, but also a fair amount of turnover um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the, you know, the end of summer really. Um, as we track the housing starts and the housing permits, um, I'll talk in a little greater detail about those that are um, those that have been in front of the planning and zoning um, and the planning department's aware of that, you know, we see as being able to generate um, school aged children in, in the near future. Um, but this is just really a historical record of what we're seeing as certificates of occupancy get issued. Um, unfortunately, the state's a little bit behind on the data. We don't even have um, 2019 yet, but in talking with the town planning department, um, the same trend that been recently experienced where um, we're seeing some demolition permits and then the tear down and rebuilds are kind of netting themselves out and really the addition all units are coming through um, some of that multifamily development in town. Um, getting on to that multifamily development and we'll talk about the students generated from that a little later on in the slide deck. Um, these were several projects that we had discussed um, at last year's presentation. Um, they're still on the in play now as they're continuing to phase in occupancy. Um, Kensett phase two is under construction, um, 14 total units there. That's looking at early still 2021 um, for COs being issued there. Um, there's several TOD or tr transit oriented style multifamily um, developments. Um, we have uh, you know our eyes on the 116 units for um, Corbin Block. Um, that's gonna Fair watching, especially as we look at when those students get phased into our projections um, for the Tokenique district 
And then in Royal, we have um, the 122 unit apartment at the Commons and the 59 unit apartment at Neroten Heights Shopping Center. I'm um, phasing those into our enrollment projections as well over that 10 year horizon. This is just taking a real good historic look back. Um, gosh, over 40 years now at your historic elementary enrollment. Um, a peak going back to 1974 corresponded with a more recent peak in 2013, 2014. And you'll see the slight dip that's been happening since then. I think what makes Darien unique when I look at um, your community versus some of the others that we work for within the region, um, you've had a much um, longer lag from when the housing market um, declined in the Great Recession to when you started actually seeing some declining enrollments in many of our other client communities that was much more abrupt um, than what we're seeing now. And now we're seeing just a little bit of a slow attrition in the enrollment. Um, looking at the leading edge of your enrollments, which is always your kindergarten, um, your elementary school system, um, it's been remarkably flat over a good portion of the early 2000s. Um, over the last several years, we've seen a bit of a decline since 2013-14 of about 12%. Um, in the last three years, there's been a decline of about 3%. And some of that's birth driven. Um, as we saw earlier on that birth slide, we had some of those smaller birth cohorts. And now we're getting into more of a, what I would call a typical, you know, from a demographic standpoint, the typical birth cycles where you do have some undulations, you do have some peaks and valleys between those. Um, it'll be interesting to bear watching to see what that's going to look like going forward. And as we talk about the um, elementary school enrollment, it's always important to talk about the children that are in the system, especially as we move ahead. And I'll, and I'll talk about the middle school and high school projections in a community like Darien, that's very stable. Um, a lot of students, it's just really the matriculation of students through the system. Um, in this colorized chart here, um, we're identifying a very large kindergarten class back in uh, 2009 and 10, which is going to correspond to your current 11th grade class. And that you know, larger cohort or bubble as they move through the system is going to be, you know, kind of adding into that class size a little bit. Um, but what we're also seeing is that over the last several years, we're seeing some smaller kindergarten class sizes. And as those matriculate through the elementary system and into the middle school system, you start to see some decline in enrollment as a larger, say, fifth grade may leave a given school building, um, may leave the elementary school system, move up into the middle school itself. Um, you're going to have some little bit of dramatic shifts as these uh, bubbles and smaller waves move into the uh, move into the various grade group schools. This is a look back of your historic elementary enrollment. Um, this is really what we kind of track as we develop what's been happening within each neighborhood um, in a community that groups by neighborhood, which you do. Um, we develop individual school projections based on the history of the enrollment there, as well as the future births and housing activities there. So as we look back and track through it, we could see that back in 2013, 14, Hindley had a bit of a decline and has been declining since then. Um, Tokenique over the last couple of years has had a, a modest decline, whereas Holmes has been a little bit steady and then dipped down this past year. Ox Ridge is one that jumped out to us in the last several years. Um, it has been, uh, it has shown increasing enrollment over the last two. And then um, Royal has been fairly flat um, over the last four years. Looking at the middle school enrollment, it's been very, very stable, actually remarkably stable um, in the 1100s, you know, dating back as far as my eye could see on this chart. Um, but really over the last few years, about 1150 students there. Um, you're getting a, a lot of similarities between those grades that are, are graduating out into the high school versus those that are graduating up from the elementary schools. Um, the high school enrollment had a recent peak going back to 2018-19. Um, we're seeing a dip in the enrollment since then, um, but prior to that, it was a, a fairly steady climb. I believe the, uh, the decrease over the last couple of years has been about 4%. So as we get into our enrollment projections, a, a methodology that we've relied heavily on is really that cohort survival. Um, that not only looks at the grade level to grade level survivability, um, per grade. So as a group of say 100 um, kindergartners moves on into first grade and the ratio is 1.05, um, that 100 kindergartners would turn into 105 first graders um, that following year. 
Um, we, we look at that as a good way to be able to do grade level projections, especially for individual schools. It does not perform well though when um, we're trying to be able to account for development or a rapidly changing economy. Um, so when we look at um, a community and we have known housing developments, known projects coming, that's where we break from the, uh, the construct of the cohort survival methodology and begin adding in things like housing mu multipliers and making slight adjustments to it in order to account for things that aren't getting picked up on the model because they're not really baked into the data that built it, um, but we know are coming down the pipeline. And that's where I'll talk a little bit about some of the housing developments and the multipliers we use for that. This is just our typical assumption slide. It's, it always goes back to um, as long as things are status quo, that's what we build a lot of our projections on. If we're changing in boundaries, changing in policy, um, those will obviously have changed in individual schools. I don't see anything being planned like that. Here we are aware of um, some planned expansion to pre-K, um, also predicated on um, really having stable trends in your independent school enrollment um, and not having major changes in any of the policies um, dictating or governing where um, students can or cannot attend within the district. So what we've been tracking with the birth decay, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier, is way back in um, the early 2000s, um, and not only in Darien, but many of the communities throughout Connecticut, um, your birth to kindergarten ratio, they were always very closely aligned. Um, it was always uh, that generation um, that was having children at that time, you would always sort of buy the house, lay down roots, and then um, have children within the community they would eventually attend as kindergartners. Um, and as we moved through and really you know, got around to the time of the Great Recession, we started to see a little bit of a change in, in, that, in that mentality where um, we had a greater disconnect and divide between birth and kindergarten enrollment five or six years later. Um, and that can be seen really from 2010 on where many more or, or much more of your kindergartners um, were born in a different community, but arrived in, in Darien, um, say in anywhere between the ages of zero and five. Um, so immigration became a much bigger factor in being able to project um, where the kindergarten enrollment would land in any given year. And then what we saw over the last two years was that that data started to come back together again a little bit. Um, we had a little bit of a disconnect this, this year, but that's really probably um, just due to um, you know, the, the effects of the pandemic. Um, but overall, it's been correlating really well. Um, last year in town, we did see one of your greatest levels of immigration at 1.04%. Um, so what, what that is, we look at the aggregate of um, grouped grades. So um, for your community, we take grades two through seven, and then we compare that to look like what that group's cohort looked like the following year as grades three through eight, did it grow, did it shrink? And then we develop estimates of migration based upon that. Um, last year, we were at a positive 1%. This year, at we're at a negative half a percent, um, likely due to some of the pandemic, um, as well as a lower than expected um, 11th to 12th grade persistency ratio, um, where we noted this year that it dropped below um, a whole number of one for the first time at least in the data that we've been tracking, actually going back to the, the Great Recession in 2008, 2009. Um, so that was something that we saw as an anomaly and um, was one of those factors that um, our knowledge of the community, we were able to um, you know, minimize the impact of that going forward. Um, but overall, your birth decay dropped off a little bit at 1.522. It was a little bit lower last year, but we see the change from about 1.6 um, down to 1.52 as being largely attributed um, to some of the decline we saw in that early data from August to say October, um, where some of those families opted um, out um, or withdrew, um, that was a large driving force to that. As we look at immigration within the schools, what we do is we track um, student IDs um, basically from year to year. We have a pretty large data set having worked in um, Darien for a number of years. Um, what we see is some patterns to the data. I think over the last two years, um, we've seen a little bit of a similar pattern. Um, overall, the total number of students as part of this immigration analysis has been fairly steady. We had 110 um, this year, our total movement. 
um, into the schools. Um, 114 last year, 1819 was a little bit of a lower year. Um, we saw more new students in um, Tokenique this year. That was had the largest amount of immigration followed by um, Oxridge. Oxridge last year was the highest with uh, Tokenique second, um, but that pattern's been a little bit stable over the last two years overall. One of the other things we look at are enrollments from housing sales. So what we do is we purchase um, through the MLS, through the Warren Group, um, housing sales by address. And we have students that are address mapped within our enrollment management software. Um, so as we look at new students to the district, we could also look at whether those new students um, coincided with um, the sale of um, a sale of a single family home within the community. And I went back and we've been doing this for a number of years here and it, it was quite interesting um, despite, in spite of the pandemic, um, this breakdown of say 60 some elementary school students, um, a dozen or so middle school students and single digits in the high school has held, has held through or held true um, by and large for the last several years of that analysis. Um, where we're not really seeing a discernible pattern though is over on the individual elementary school side. It really seems that um, there's either the houses that are you know, on the market or the individual um, local, really localized real estate factors are, are driving that. Um, with this year, we saw Tokenique as well as Oxridge um, yielding the most students um, per, for, for the total number of housing sales there overall and um, Henley and Royal um, down near the bottom this year. Um, when we looked at the average district yield, and this is actually a pretty good proxy number in that first bullet of point, um, regardless of um, some sales have students, some sales don't, but overall per every single family home sale within your community, it generates 0.24 students um, this year. And uh, that was slightly lower than the number we had last year, um, but on par for you know what we saw in some of the dips and some of the other um, communities we're working in. And then um, overall about 32% of the new students in the elementary school um, we're tied to home sales and you know that was a little bit lower than last year um, and it was a little bit disconnected especially when we had a, a really marked up you know a, a notable increase in our total housing sales we thought we would have saw a little bit of different number there slightly higher number there but it it didn't didn't pan out um, we did update our demographic multiplier so we added another year last year it was four year average enrollment um, in order to gauge the light, the number of students per grade level um, that are coming from new development within Darien, especially um, those that are that you know higher density multifamily development, really the best data out there is to use your local data. Um, so what we have is what we've done is we've matched up the students over the last five years to each of these developments, and then looked at um, what the generation rate is um, based on elementary, middle, and high school and then take the average of that number and use these as our student multipliers um, for the new developments that we're seeing within the community. Um, it's much more accurate than using some of the third party data that's actually quite a bit dated out there. So this is just a, a map showing the, um, showing your elementary school districts um, in the solid colors in the background, as well as um, the entire list that we got from the planning department of the developments and their star and color coded on um, whether they're approved and not yet built, um, partially under construction or recently completed and showing in the red star. Um, and the way we factor this in is we take a look at the location of it and then we take a, late, a look at our multipliers and look at the number of units that are approved or under construction as well as the phasing for that and are able to then um, generate what we're likely going to see through a typical phase up of the units, um, what's going to be developed in town. Um, and this is just the, uh, this is just the complete report um, we received from the planning and zoning department back in October. Um, for many of the single family homes that are on here, um, you know, we're listing them. However, um, they largely get, they're already baked into the uh, enrollment model. So we don't do uh, multipliers for those, but for the ones that are large scale, um, especially the ones that I've, Kind of noted to already um these are really the ones that we're focusing on and adding those multipliers in so you know as we look at 
the Roten Heights Shopping Center, 59 total units there. Um, we're estimating 27 students will be generated over the, uh, over the next 10 years there um, with the breakdown of 13 elementary, six middle and eight high school. Um, federal Realty, 122, um, 56 students there. Um, a majority of those as elementary at 27, 12 middle school and 17 high school. And then the other notable project is uh, the Corbin District Project. Um, and that has 116 units with a, a potential yield of 53 um, students with uh, 26 being elementary, 11 middle and 16 high school. And this just describes how we're planning to phase those up based on our conversations with the planning department, basically um, adding those students generated from those units and in incrementally over a number of years as COs are issued and um, following a, a good pattern for um, what would likely be um, the addition of students to those baseline projections. So then as part of our regular projections assumptions, um, starting way back when and really the onset of the Great Recession, you know, prior to that, we would always give one set of projections. Um, and the one set of projections under, you know, pretty stable conditions held well. Um, but then we started realizing that, boy, we hit a Great Recession. And now here we are with the pandemic, maybe we should, um, we, maybe we're a little ahead of the curve and you know, doing it a little earlier with the recession, but we develop low, medium and high growth projections and then give a recommendation. Um, so the district has those in their back pockets and really understands what some of the assumptions are driving those. So for our, um, for our low projection, we're assuming a slowing of the housing market, obviously slowing of the economy. Our medium growth is really a modest economic rebound and aligns well with the recent um, housing market trends we're seeing. Um, the high is assuming that we would have 10 years of accelerated economic recovery as well as acceleration um, from where you're at today within that housing market. Um, and all of them assume that we're increasing the pre-K number from 90 to 150. And then that the multipliers that we discussed are getting added in at the individual school level um, to be able to have that captured within the elementary schools themselves. And then they roll up into the middle school and the high school. So looking at our media model, I think one of the things that really jumps out to me um, is just the stability in the enrollment in Darien. Um, we're at about 4,600 students today. Um, by and large, we're looking across, even though we have some slight waves here where we can see in the stack bar chart, the elementary enrollment's flat, and then it comes up a little bit. Um, and then we have some uh, a, we have some dip in the middle school enrollment and then some increase and then a little dip in the high school. Um, by and large, you're, you're a system of 4,600 um, students overall for the, uh, for the K-12 system over the next 10 years. This is looking at the lower end of our projections. I believe um, this one has a, a tail end of about 4,300 students for, uh, for K-12 overall. Um, and this is based on you know, a slower, slower housing market, um, slower immigration into the community, as well as um, more subdued births that, than we're projecting. Um, the medium is, and this is really just the details of the year by year, um, grade by grade, um, and what it means for your grouped grades of your elementary, middle, and high. Um, but overall, looking at um, 4,584 to 4,600 elementary system going from uh, roughly 2050 um, at, at your midpoint increasing to 2,100, and then ending up just south of, uh, just south of 2,200 out 10 years. Um, and then the middle school, by and large, around 1,100 students a slight dip midpoint added to about, you know, 1,050, 1,030, um, but then a slow rebound as some of those larger grades matriculate through. Um, and then the high school is going to, going to experience a, a slight dip as you graduate some of those larger, uh, larger grade cohorts. I, I pointed to that kindergarten class early on as it moves through, um, you know, that's an 11th grade class this year. That'll be a, a graduating class. And then um, you're going to be fairly stable at about 1,450 um, and then end up at about 1,300 for the last half of the projection horizon. Um, and this is our optimistic model, which sees a, a continued ramp up um, throughout the entirety of the 10 years, um, which is really um, something that would be a bit of an anomaly, but um, overall ending up at about a 4,800 student system, um, the K-5 at 2,350. Uh, middle school because it does lag a little bit 1100 and then i'm not seeing much in the high school as those grades kind of matriculate up still at about 13 1400. 
And this is just a nice little summary of, uh, of what I've discussed, but I think the key takeaways are, um, you know, overall looking at last year to this year, there's been a, a small increase um, at the elementary school. The middle school did see a, a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a decrease or we'll see a little bit of a decrease for next year. Um, the high school will see a little bit of a bump as the larger eighth grade class moves up. And then within the elementary school system over the next five years, um, we're going to see a, a small increase of three and a half percent. The middle school will um, decrease by eight and the high school is projected to increase by four um, percent overall. And then beyond five years, um, we just really started looking at the uh, at those grade level groupings that I discussed. Um, but um, really the high school would be the one that would be a little bit different in seeing that matriculation, those smaller um, cohorts through, um, looking at a more steady decline there. Um, looking at your individual school projections, um, we know we had some fluctuations in our recent past, and I think um, starting at the bottom or in the uh, in the yellow or you know tan color um, for Royal. Um, as we look at this dip here, we're seeing a, a, a large fourth grade class turning into a fifth grade class, and then moving on. And then as some of those units that I discussed early on, um, the Nero in Heights as well as the Federal Commons um, start coming online and getting occupied, we're going to see a little bit of a a ramp up here in enrollment and eventually stabilizing at 370, 380 out for the last six or seven years of the uh, projection horizon. Um, homes is gonna follow a little bit more of a cyclical cycle. You're gonna see some up, ups and downs as some um, you know, fifth grade classes graduate and some smaller kindergarten classes come in and then um, vice versa. Um, but overall, really gonna end up in the mid 400s to uh, just under 450 out um, 10 years. And then Tokenique is going to see a slow increase um, from where you're at today, upwards to about 445, 440 students and flatten off in the 440s for the last five years of the, of the projection horizon. Um, Hinley is going to have some ups and downs and then eventually stabilize at about 450 students for the last five years. And the same can be said um, for Oxridge, they will get a little bit of a bubble year in 24, 25, but overall um, stabilized at about 450 or so um, students. And this is just a look at the uh, detail by school and grade um, for the individual projections. And with that, I will pass it back to the board for um, any questions. Thank you, Mr. Zuba. Um, I will open it up for any board questions. Um, do, we, do we track the number of children who opted for homeschooling, not remote learning, but homeschooling this year? And if so, are those numbers put into these projections? Um, I, th I think Mr. Zuba has done the, uh, some of the private school centers, but I don't think we have done, we have tracked that. Is that what the question was? My, my question would just be, in this year, I can understand that there are certain uh, parents every year there's parents who opt for homeschooling and this year we may or may not have seen more and so are we capturing those students who may be in a covert environment opted for homeschooling but we would expect back over time to opt back into the public school system i would i would need to check the number of homeschool kids um i don't i i i don't sense it it was unusual i don't have a track record of it um I, I, yeah, I didn't receive uh, much updates of it at all, actually. Um, so I would just confirm what the number actually is. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and and I I did receive a, a short report on that, and um, when we looked at the homeschooling itself, it was rather nominal. Um, we did have some opt outs, but um, compared to what we've seen in some other districts, um, the numbers of homeschooling was 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 rather nominal. It didn't require us to artificially add the students back in where in some other places it was such to a degree um, we had to go ahead and um, sort of plug that hole so that the numbers were correct for next year as they would return. Um, that was not the case within your district. And I really believe it came down to the model that um, you chose to open your school year with. Um, we're starting to see as uh, some of these data points come in, some commonalities there with, uh, with some districts that open under certain models and what that looked like, especially for kindergarten first, and even to some degree, second grade enrollment. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Sini. Is, is there any data looking back, you know, several years to look at the accuracy versus the forecast? Yeah, we've uh, we've been tracking our projections um, really out from when we started doing them in each community. Typically, where we fall, especially in Darien, has been just under 1% per year. Um, however, when we do track it, but that's being that's being tracked as a, as a group system. So at the K-12 level, obviously when you get to some of the smaller grade groupings such as kindergarten, um, you know, we're performing, you know, more closer to two or 3% per year in some of those. Um, but overall we're, we're just under 1% per year. I'm sorry, 1% per year represents what number? The, the differential versus your forecast? Yes. Okay, it, it plus or minus? For Darien, over this year, we actually ran um, a little bit above the number. Um, in years past, we were running just a little bit below the number. Okay, so pretty much on target. Yeah, pr pretty much on target. And, um, you know, and I think this slide does a good job of representing it. So many things happen in the community like Darien where um, you can get a couple housing sales and um, they could yield a large number of um, school children and even some sales that leave have an, a net result. So we always see this shift where we never get some of the individual grades right. But by and large, when we look at the K-12 grouping, um, we're always tracking really well there. Um, it just gets a little bit more challenging, especially at the individual school level, um, just because of the, the dynamics of the community and the dynamics of the housing. And then just one quick follow-up. Um, we have three major projects coming online within the next two to four years. Um, maybe discuss some of the variability relative to forecast and how difficult that is, because that seems like a big swing factor uh, given the density. It is, it is. So um, they, they, the town planning department just loves when we call them and bother them constantly about that. So yeah, in private development and part of my company does do private development. So I get how, um, you know, nothing's ever kind of set in stone. So we're tracking these developments um, you know, really Corbin Block, the Commons, the Roten Heights Shopping Center. And here's where I've kind of laid out what I think is going to happen based on the conversations with um, the planning and zoning. Um, we're seeing that, um, you know, Kensett Square is just wrapping up. The Roten Heights Shopping Center and Federal Realty, um, they're expected to break ground in 2021. They're expected to have full completion by 24 and 23, respectively. Um, so what we started doing is we started looking at that full breadth of multipliers and began phasing them in incrementally, knowing that um, students in any development don't show up all at once, but they show up a little bit over time. So I feel we're a, a little bit conservative there and probably more accurate represents what would happen on the ground. The question is, will the construction stay to schedule? That's something that we are using the best information on, but you're right, quite frankly, um, that that, that may in fact change. All right, thank you. Any other questions from the board? I'm not sure I would ask, I don't you know, Rich or Dr. Adley, I know I heard through an OPC meeting, there's another project, potentially Parklands, which the number was 52 units. So I'm not sure at what point that makes its way into uh, what we look at. I think it's important from a forecast standpoint, and especially as the facilities team looks at, you know, potential um, library redesign and other changes to these classes. I think looking out, if there's stuff like that that's on the horizon, makes sense to include it. Yeah, that's a good, that's Go a good, that's a really good point. Um, we've gotten burned in the past a little bit when we've included something that hasn't been approved because it, it kind of either the, the funding got pulled on the private side or the developer lost interest. So that's something that I'd like to get on my radar and see exactly what some of the specifics are and maybe make some adjustments without really kind of burning it into the model yet, but just to be more aware of it. This is awesome. Um, just to follow up on something Mr. Sini was mentioning, and, and I'm sorry, I was taking notes, but I missed it. Have we gone back and looked at what our projections were for um, Kensett, Avalon, and what the reality was, and, and look to see how close we were on building projects? 
because we did project at one point in a Malone and McBroom what we thought they would be and, and are we over, under, or have we not had a chance to look at that? Um, I, I, I definitely remember Kensit and I remember projecting it, but I don't remember what I did, but I have that in my files and that's something I'd be happy to get your response on because I'm curious myself to see exactly what we thought was going to come out of it and what did come out of it. I think Avalon was a little bit before that was already that was already built and occupied mostly before um, you know my time of starting work here. But I'll look back to see if I have anything on that one. I definitely know I have phase one of uh, of Kenzit. You yeah, might have Kenzit had some competing factors that might have changed it, but it'd be interesting, I think, to your point. Mm -hmm. I agree yeah. completely. That's great. that's actually a great question. And the heights of varying might also be one that you could look at forecast versus reality. I guess the, the only other thing that pops into my head about Avalon, and I don't know whether that's changed, but originally too, that seemed to be a destination for people that were in the process of moving, building. And I don't know if those numbers are captured in a, in a migration slide. Yeah. In terms of people going in Avalon for a year or two and then moving out. Yeah, they, they really are. I have it captured right here, I think. I think that I think that's by and large what we're seeing in Tokenique is, and hopefully everybody can see slide 20, is sort of this Avalon factor. Um, I think some of that immigration in and out um, is being captured here where we're picking up a new student one year that wasn't there um, the previous year. Um, and I bet if you were to do a more micro level analysis of the students coming out of there, even though the total number of students is pretty steady, I bet the student body itself, the actual students um, you know, may see, may see a high degree of change from year to year. Thank you. Any other further board questions? Good. Thank you very much, Mr. Zuba. Appreciate it. No problem. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to discussion and possible acceptance of contemplated gift for the Darien High School Music Department, Dr. Adley and Ms. Thompson. Yeah, if I may, uh, just reintroduce you to uh, your director of uh, music, uh, Colleen Thompson. And uh, I'll, I'll let Colleen introduce uh, uh, the gift from one of our I don't know if it's her alum or not, but we'll, we'll, we'll. Uh, Yes, um, so we were offered a full-size base and we'd like to accept it uh, for student use at Darien High School. Um, it's a lovely instrument. Um, Jane Menace, our high school uh, orchestra director was contacted by um, the owner of Atelier Strings. Uh, they, we do a lot of business with them out of Greenwich. They do a lot of our string repairs and uh, rent instruments to our string students. Uh, he had been contacted by uh, Mr. Perrone about, um, he actually wanted to sell the bass and uh, the owners, uh, the employees at Atelier uh, actually suggested that he donated it instead. Uh, called Jane, we looked at the instrument. Um, it's in really great shape. Uh, they appraised it for us at about $4,500. And uh, we have a student ready to use it for both jazz and orchestra. So we would like to accept it. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. I'll open it up for any board questions or comments. Just thank you for the gift. Yep, getting there. Um, <laughs> so um, I guess it's a motion to accept. Motion to approve the gift. A motion to approve the gift of a $4,500 appraised donation on a double bass and bow to the Darien High School Music Department from uh, Mr. Perron. Uh, so for a uh, uh, motion to accept, uh, Sarah Parent, second. Dennis Maroney, all in favor, that's unanimous. And then a big thank you to Mr. Perron for that uh, generous gift to the music department and I'm sure it will be well used by the um, incredible group of students we have in the music department. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good, thank you. Moving on to further discussion and possible action on proposed Board of Education policies. These are the proposed policy COVID policies, uh, C-19 concerning health and safety protocols relating to COVID-19. Uh, proposed policy 5300 relating to student use of the district's computer system and electronic communications. Proposed revisions to policy 5130C19 relating to student attendance, truancy, and chronic absenteeism. 
and proposed revisions to policy 1250C19, school volunteers, student interns, and other non-employees, policy 1225, visitors, policy 1200, use of school facilities, and proposed revised policy 5220, student discipline. These um, are policies that were discussed and reviewed at the last meeting. It was decided uh, members of the board wanted more time to review these and discuss these. Um, Marge, anything you wanted to add at this time or Dr. Adley? So we did go through and clean up the policies. If you open them up, you can see that now there's a notice in yellow at the top so that um, people know exactly which language will expire. The only thing that's um, substantially different than last time is that Chipman and Goodwin changed its recommendations for the policy on students' use of the district computer systems, acknowledging that these probably shouldn't expire because distance learning and remote learning will be with us in the future, whether or not we access it. Also, our policy was very confusing in the way it was written. We can't really figure out where we diverged from the Shipman and Goodwin policy, but Gwen Satoon and I, when we reviewed it, didn't feel that even though the provisions were the same, it didn't give adequate notice to people of what exactly was prohibited. So there isn't really a substantive change, but it's streamlined. Some of the definitions have been updated um, to comply with changes in the law, but I think that it just gives better notice to people of what our expectations are on our computers. So I'll open up for further board conversation, Mr. Sini. Arch, can you walk through the colors? Red's a, a, um, a delete, it looks like blue is a change. What is the green? So for some reason, when you go in multiple times, well, everything that's not black is a change and everything that's COVID is yellow. So sometimes when Shipman and Goodwin uses that software, it, but it's all, it's all just changes. Okay, so it's it was iterations kind. probably and changes yeah. at the Shipman, yeah. Shipman office. Right. So the yellow is COVID related yes. and then the rest is all the changes. The others are changes from our policy. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Good. Any further questions or conversation from the board? Mr. Maroney. So Marge, on 5300, you said that that should go permanent, but we're going to make it a COVID-19 for now, correct? That's the right. So I hope that that's not what I wrote because I, um, right. So no, I think that that one should, Shipman and Goodwin recommends that that be permanent because the language that they had initially added about distance learning and whatever that was set to expire, they now recommend won't expire because we could use some form of remote learning in the future. And that would give us the option of having lots of rules in place to support that learning. And you don't have it marked as- Mrs. Ahmed. <laughs> learning. Thank you. Um, you don't have it marked here as a C policy. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Any further conversations or questions? And, sure, Mrs. And there's a couple of typos. Is that something that we need to worry about now or you will clean up? Um, if you wanted to email me or, I mean, I don't think we need to do it now, but yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. So we can move forward voting on these and read them. I should read each one individually and we can do one vote accepting all the policies. So, hmm? yep. So, okay. So, um, should I just reread the top sentence again? That sure. makes sense. Um, motion and action um, on Board of Education Policy C-19, policy concerning health and safety protocols relating to COVID-19 pandemic. Policy 5300 C-19 relating to the student use of the district's computer system and electronic communications. Revisions to policy 5130 C-19 relating to student attendance, truancy and chronic absenteeism. Revisions to policy 1251 C19, school volunteers, student interns, and other non employees. Policy 1225, visitors. Policy 1200, use of school facilities. Policy 5220, student discipline. And, and uh, action to repeal current policy of 5220, student discipline. So I have a motion to accept these policies. Uh, Mr. Sini, a second. Mrs. Ackman, all in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you.
Moving along, further uh, review and possible action on the proposed 2021-2022 budget calendar, Dr. Adams. Yes, um, well, what well, is before you is a budget calendar. I do believe we have one proposed change to that um, that we was alluded to this evening. My recommendation based on what was said earlier in public comments from FMB that the January 19th meeting not be tentative, but that we go into our schedule as a meeting. Okay, any further board comments or questions around the possible? Yes, Mrs. Ackman. We wanna meet every week of January. We, uh, and the history on this is we added a third meeting in January right. about two years ago. Now we're looking at meeting every week. Could we? Could Mr. Saney, could we cancel one if not necessary? I mean, is that like just- I that, suppose if we go through the process and don't see the need to go to the next meeting or- I think the history is why we left it as tentative. Right. To give us some time. So we're give... hearing from FMB that they will not be prepared to present to us on January 12th. So I, it seems to me that there will be a meeting required on the 19th. So can we approve this as it stands with meeting Board of Finance in January to be confirmed and give have the flexibility in there? Or tentative. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think what we're hearing is that, or, or my suggestion would be is that FMB would like to meet. And so I think if we look at the schedule, we've got the, the Thursday meeting, we've got on the 7th, we've got all day Saturday. We could we could make the 19th official. What I would just caution to FMB or maybe call to their attention is that if we have a snow day, they're still looking at a three day turnaround. Right. So I'm happy to, I mean, the board can consider and I'm happy to honor FMB you, but just know how often you're meeting. Um, but that's fine. If they're saying they won't be ready on the 12th, um, maybe what we might want to do is take, maybe make the Board of Finance the 19th off, also, have them both come that night and keep the 12th a regular meeting and the chair and the superintendent could decide whether we have additional budget issues to add to that agenda so you don't have long, long meetings every week in January. I like that. That makes so just sense. to change the um, like meeting with Board of Finance to be confer confirmed, they're usually the same night anyway. Just make them both on the 19th. That gives both other boards time. And then we know the 12th is a regular meeting and you have the flexibility to add a board issue that night. Should be so we would be amending this to eliminate January 12th and confirm both for January 19th. No, no. We didn't eliminate the 12th. Regular, just leave the 12th as a regular Board of Education meeting and yeah. take off that we are, as part of a budget calendar, meeting with the Board of Finance and RTM Education Finance and Budget and have all of that on the 19th. I'll move that to the 19th. Okay. We take the 12th off this calendar. Yes, because it's a yeah. regular meeting of the Board of Education. Yep. Yep. And move Board of Finance, RTM Education to the 19th. Okay. Agreed. The other question. Um, Go ahead, Mrs. Ackman. Um, I think we just need to make sure, Dr. Adley, we, yep. we have a work session with the Board of Education, uh, Board of Finance, and it often conflicts with our Board of Education meeting. Have we sorted that with the Board of Finance? Like we have a regular Board of Education meeting April 6th, and the Board of Finance is having their final vote April 6th, but certainly we should have representation there. Do we want to change that regular Board of Education meeting, which we don't have to do tonight? But we might want to take it off the budget calendar. It's the April 6th. Uh -huh. and April 6th. Yes. So we as a board may want to consider maybe even at a future date yeah. amending that meeting. Okay. And Mr. Sini. Somewhat budget related, I think. Did, have you guys come to a conclusion yet in terms of the appropriation request timing and how that would fit in against this or? I think that's a separate conversation okay. not tied to this calendar. Okay. Got um, and that we need to do a follow-up conversation with the Board of Finance. Okay, still in process. Thank you. Yeah. 
So you captured what that motion would be to amend the. Yes. So I think motion. I think we can just say as amended. When you read so motion to approve the 2021-22 budget calendar as amended. Okay. So a motion to approve um, as amended the proposed 2021-2022 uh, budget calendar. Um, do I hear a motion for that? Uh, Mrs. Stein, a second. Mr. Maroney, all in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Further discussion and action on proposed regular Board of Education meetings for the 2021 calendar year, Dr. Adley. Uh, these are just the statutory requirements to, to have it on file uh, for 2021 school year. Any questions or comments on the proposed 2021 Board of Education meeting calendar at this time? Well, based on what we just said, if April 6th is the Board of uh, Finance vote, do we want right. to switch April 6th? Um, Dr. Adley, when is April vacation this year? So that is where we end up with our problem. You'll end up with such a long break. So you may have to just move it to the 7th. Usually we do a Wednesday. Yeah, right? yeah. you just won't so be able to find a Tuesday. Move the April meeting to Wednesday, April seventh, or any holiday. April seventh, which is a Wednesday. So, proposed amendment to the uh, regular Board of Education meeting for the twenty twenty one calendar year to move the April sixth meeting to Wednesday, April seventh and accept the amended proposed regular Board of Education meeting for 2021. Do have a motion to accept that? Mrs. Parent, uh, second, Mr. Maroney, all in favor? Thank you. Um, action items. Uh, contract agreement between the Darien Board of Education and the Darien Administrators Association, Dr. Adley. Uh, this was a, a very amicable agreement um, between our administrators. Uh, uh, who are an integral part of our leadership team and an organization and have done a tremendous job uh, through the COVID of leading, leading their buildings. Uh, there were very few issues to be discussed in this uh, because it's a very collaborative group of uh, individuals um, who as professionals do what they have to do, um, as indicated by the number of classes they're substituting for at the moment. Uh, so so there's, very, there's really no substantial uh, language changes this is a contract uh, through 21 uh, through June 24. It reflects a general wage increase of uh, 2% uh, every year and a three year total increase of 6.32 uh, as an average of 2.11 per year. There are no, uh, they have no steps. Uh, there's, one, uh, there's one member who gets an increment uh, just based on where uh, that person started. But uh, beyond that, it was really a 2% wage increase. Health insurance is 21, 21, and 22 percent. Are you open up to any questions from the board? So negotiations are handled in executive session, and this is an action item. It's on for approval. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Um, so a motion to approve the contract agreement between the Darien Board of Education and the Darien Administrators Association. Uh, do I have a motion? Mrs. Ackman to second. Mrs. Parent, all in favor? Thank you all, that's unanimous. Um, action item, a memorandum of understanding between the Darien Board of Education and the Darien Education Association, Dr. Adley. As discussed in executive session, this was, a, this was an agreement reached to in the early hours of Thursday, October 29th uh, with our uh, DEA uh, for impact bargaining. Um, it is, as you see before you, and as we discussed in executive session, much of it is to do around the working conditions of COVID-19. Uh, beyond that, um, the changes are, as you see them before you, there, much of it is a, in, in really clarification. There are two additional personal days, uh, clarification of the flexibilities of teacher evaluation. And that is about it. Good, thank you, Dr. Adley. A motion to approve the memorandum of understanding between the Darien Board of Education and the Darien Education Association. Do I have a first motion, Mrs. Parent? A second, Mr. Maroney, all in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. Uh, personnel items. Um, 
Marge? Just replacing um, two teachers who left us, unfortunately, in the middle of the year and welcoming a new member of the finance department. We are still looking for a Spanish teacher at the middle school, as long as I'm asking for context. <laughs> <laughs> if you know anyone. <laughs> Thank you, Marge. Thanks for all the hard work coming out of your department, looking for all these great folks. A motion to approve the personnel items as outlined in the memo dated November 10th, 2020. A motion to approve. Uh, Mrs. Ritchie, second, Mr. Maroney, all in favor? That's unanimous. Uh, public comment. Hit that in the budget next year, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Please bear with us for a moment, thank you. Good evening. If you would like to speak during public comment, click the participants icon on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Next, click the raised hand option. You will notice a blue hand icon appear in the upper corner of your screen where your face, name, and or number appears. When it is your turn to speak, the facilitator will identify you and announce that you're unmuted for public comment. Once recognized and unmuted, please state your name and address. You will have to three minutes to comment. There are no raised hands at this time. Thank you. Uh, I would like to make a motion to adjourn. Uh, Mrs. Ackman, second, Mr. Sini. Thank you, thank you all for your patience as we transition. And have a good evening, all unanimous. All in favor, unanimous, thank you.